we have a discussion. So, Scott, you can stay up here. I can have all the speakers back up here. We have, I think, 10 minutes, something like that, for a general discussion of impacts and volcanism on the moon. Um, and so I think that what is relevant or could be relevant is the content of the talks, but if there are some general issues about volcanism and impact cratering on the moon, you now have a panel of expertise to address them to. So I would open the floor up to any of those issues. Questions, comments? All right, Paul Niles of JSC. I got one more question. Okay, Paul Niles, JSC. Um, Robin, uh, so I'm interested in the the formation mechanism of. You talked a lot about the the creation of this um, of the material and the ring around Mars. What what would be the impact on the surface uh, features? Or is this so so early in history that it's all been? Do you think probably wiped out? Well, presumably this could have formed the Borealis Basin. Right. So there's a, um, uh, there's a range of impact energies that are associated with the formation of, this, of that basin. And the impacts that I was showing fall at the lower end of that range. But that's the scale of this event. Okay. So you would have a, a partial melting event. It would not be a whole scale melting of the entire surface of the planet. And would the reaccretion of the material have have an effect? I mean, would it have a sort of uh, localized area based on the formation? So um, it has been uh, proposed previously that you might have large moons tidally decaying inward that hit Mars, preferentially around its equator, to leave basins. Uh, I think more likely, as the material spirals in, it's going to break up as it gets within the Roche limit. And so you're going to have a deposition of material from the disk progressively over time onto Mars. And this is an issue that's actually d been discussed recently in a paper by um, Hesselbrock and Mitten uh, that came out just this spring. They estimate the uh, quantity of material that one might have reaccreted onto Mars, which would then be a mixture of material ejected from Mars and from this impacting, I would argue, series size object. So can I, can I ask a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. I just got to follow. So um, basically, because it's in the vicinity and the um, the disk that the velocities are really low, so they would really be affected by the Roche limit. In other words, as opposed to coming in from greater distances. Exactly. So, you, so you they're going to really be predict breakup. So they're going to be spiraling in yeah. on near circular orbits. Yeah. So that that's the situation yeah. where you will accept break. We, you will expect breakup versus coming in yep. on a direct orbit. Yeah. Tim? Yeah, I was just going to ask, Robin, uh, how many series size objects were floating around in the inner solar system you know, around this time? Would this have been the only one? <coughs> it was like a freak occurrence, or were there a bunch of them? And so we don't actually resolve this scale object well with the late stage terrestrial uh, accretion simulations. Uh, so dynamically, we don't have a firm constraint on that yet. Um, we know from the abundance of HSEs on Mars, that's associated with roughly the accretion of a series mass worth of material. So that seems consistent. Um, but this is going to be a key part of the puzzle because very different dynamical environments are implied if Bobo Stimos formed by a series size impact versus if one um, looks at capture that's a very different type of a um, heavily small body dominated population at the end of Mars accretion. So those two different modes are very different. Any other comments on that issue from the panel? Okay. Uh, does anybody have another issue they would like to raise? Yes, there, and then we'll go to Jack. Okay, I guess we're at Jack first. The microphone got there first, then we'll want to go to this gentleman over here. I'm just curious, what's, what's next and what's to be done with radar um, on um, LRO um, in, in terms of remaining length of time of the mission and a possible next extension of the mission? Uh, 
Um, so right now, we are taking data um, a few times a month. Um, so we're taking, you know, we're mapping out small portions of the moon in by static mode to try to understand what it looks like. This has never been done before. Um, so there's kind of two or three things that we're sort of focusing on, um, looking at how these things, um, how the materials look as a function of phase space, kind of how I was showing in Ejecta or on the Mare, um, comparing to terrestrial data. Um, we're also doing a lot of um, work at the poles looking for water ice. So I didn't talk about it um, in my talk, um, but water ice has kind of a, has a, dis, a different um, phase angle behavior than rocky material. And so um, in Cabeus, in the f first extended mission, we um, found evidence for sort of coherent water ice, we think. And so we're trying to map out that as much as we can in both X and S band um, right now. And so, um, so basically, we're, we're just sort of mapping out as much as we can. Our plan is to look at a lot of these sort of abnormal features. So um, depending on how large the feature is, we can resolve it moderately well you know, in the radar and just try to get as much data as we can to compare like on the imps or the new craters or any of these sorts of things to see if we can um, give sort of a depth view um, or different, different size types of views. Um, we're also looking for targets. So if people have things they want to see, um, please talk to Wes or I or anybody on the team and we can um, try to target things in the radar for you. Um, yeah. Okay, good. I have, a, I have a target. I'll have to talk with you. Okay. Um, okay, that was, for you who don't know, a question from Jack Burns at the University of Colorado. Next question is over here. If you could identify yourself, please. Uh, this is addressed to uh, Robin. Um, regarding uh, the moons of Mars, Deimos, and Phobos, uh, it's of course well known that uh, uh, they are in synchronous, in uh, temporal uh, uh, resonance uh, by uh, a one to four, I believe it is, uh, as far as orbital period is concerned. Uh, but also, what's interesting to me is that they're also in a spatial um, resonance, or uh, there is a uh, two to five uh, resonance. So my question basically is, uh, since they are the survivors of your uh, impact theory, is there a relationship between something being uh, of a survival nature as far as the moon is concerned <coughs> because of being positioned in a resonant orbit, or is that just a coincidence that we're observing? Is it a temporal anomaly that will go away? So if they form by impact, uh, they originated uh, relatively close together, and Phobos in particular was at a very different location when it formed than it is today. So from that starting point, one imagines that uh, Deimos evolved slightly outward, and Phobos evolved substantially inward. Now, during the co course of that evolution, they actually cross multiple resonant configurations that affect their orbits as they cross them. This is something that has been explored by Chuck Yoder in a 1982 paper. Mm -hmm. So, in general, we expect that anything that was larger than and or interior to Phobos that resulted from this impact would have been already tidally lost. And Phobos itself will be tidally lost in the relatively near future. So their current states, uh, their rotational locks to Mars, that's to be expected from dissipation. But their relative separation is just a product of where they are at this time. It's not where they started out. Okay, Jim wants to comment on that. Uh, can I uh, re-answer a question that was previously asked? You may. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to Bill Bakke's question. I didn't quite understand it at the time he asked it. So Bill asked the question about these irregular Mari uh, uh, foam, interpreted to be foam, these, uh, these irregular Mari patches. Um, why should the craters be smaller? Because when you look at the nuclear tests, basically um, uh, nuclear explosion craters 
like Sedan, which formed in alluvium, are larger than the ones that form like Scooter and a number of other ones in uh, basalt, for example, the cap rock out there. And, and you're absolutely right about that, but these, these are impacts into foam. So it's actually not an incoherent uh, alluvium, it's actually a coherent foam. So literally, it's like an aerogel. It, it, the impact uh, penetrates in and crushes and pushes aside and breaks the walls of the foam and then crushes material below. So that's why it's, it's basically an error. So it's not, like a, it's not like the sedan alluvium, basically. So I hope that's a better answer to your question. Okay. He's, not, he's not moving a muscle. He doesn't believe it at all. <laughs> Jim, I have a, can I have a follow-up on that? Yeah, please. We have an expert on impact oh. cratering here, of all people. So, <laughs> I mean, when we, when we look at cratering on asteroids and we look at porous material versus non-porous material, we do see crater shape differences, right? Mm -hmm. You get deeper and you tend to see deeper and narrower craters on the more porous material um, versus like a, a sheet of basalt or something. Um, have, have you guys looked at depth diameter ratios for any of the craters in yes, these we, regions? Yes, indeed, yeah. Is it and very different than? Uh, yes, it is, and we're still in the process of collecting the data. Okay. But th th these things are also sloped, so there's slope effects as well. Sure. Um, I think the critical point is uh, the ones we've looked at at the margins of these things, where you see an impact into the margin, and they're really distinctly different in terms of the morphology. So you can kind of do an experiment by, okay, that's, that's more or less solid rock, and that's not. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments for this panel? If not, one last. Jim Head wants to make a comment and he's allowed. Okay, if we're gonna close here, I just would like to say that um, please, please take a moment to remember uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, and if you wanna know what um, this guy was like, um, I encourage you to go on to um, YouTube and t uh, so so there's this thing called a lunar uh, it's an LLTB a lunar lander test vehicle which um, was like a spider and it was um, <laughs> an incredibly unstable kind of uh, flying machine so to speak so uh, Neil uh, was one of the people that flew it um, of course in preparation for Apollo 11 so you flew it out at Ellington Air Force Base and you kind of did this descent etc and if you go to um, uh, to YouTube and look at uh, LLTV Neil Armstrong. Um, yeah, uh, you'll, f you'll see what kind of person he was. So the thing is coming down to land, and it's a go to the two-minute video. It's coming down to land, and all of a sudden it starts to go unstable, and it's moving around like this. Neil ejects horizontally, okay, from this thing. Uh, it, uh, you know, comes down in his parachute, almost in the fire. That's, of course, the thing crashes and explodes, and he comes down, and then you see him hitting the ground. And then, uh, you know, an hour later, he's back at the office. And, uh, and, you know, somebody says, hey, how did it go, Neil? How come you back so early? Oh, we had, an, uh, we had an anomaly. An anomaly, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is the kind of person he was. So anyway, enjoy that and, and remember the moment 48 years ago. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, so we're going to uh, take a break, and we will reconvene in here at 3 o'clock, at which point Yvonne uh, Pendleton and Greg Schmidt will lead the final plenary session. <laughs>